Well, good evening and welcome to Life Groups at the Well. Tonight we finish uh, not just our study on the book of Hebrews, but also our life groups for this particular season. And so I want to just say thank you to, first of all, all of you life group host homes, our life group leaders. You guys are awesome. I uh, can't tell you how much we appreciate you being willing to open up your homes uh, and, and just be a place that people can come and join these groups and, and really live life together. It's been a great season, and uh, we're going to take a break for the summer. Most of our groups do break for the whole summer, but uh, each group, you guys are welcome to do uh, what you uh, want to do. We leave that up to the leaders. We will just not be producing content on Sunday nights any longer for life groups. The summer is a pretty busy time, and uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to maintain a regular weekly Sunday night schedule through the summer. So uh, we take a break. It also gives our life group leaders a little bit of a break as well from uh, having to have their homes ready every Sunday night to host groups. But it's been a great season. Very excited about um, where we're headed with life groups. I think that next year is going to be probably the best year we've ever had for life groups. And so i um, very excited about that. Uh, we will restructure life groups next year. Here's what that means. It means that um, we do some changing to our groups and um, we plan to add some groups. You can be thinking about it. This is especially to you folks that um, are part of a life group, but not necessarily a life group leader. We're going to need more leaders next year to form more groups. Honestly, groups work best when there are 8 to 12 committed people to the group. And um, it just works better. You start to get over that 15 mark and you lose a little bit of what we're trying to accomplish through small groups. Also, uh, consider, do you want to stay part of the same group next year? You know, some people do. Some people uh, really fall in love with their group and, and really would rather stay with that group and keep it the same for years. And we do not have a problem with that. We think if this is where those types of relationships are built, great. But there are others who kind of like the idea of switching each year building you know a year of good relationships with a few people and then they will continue to foster those relationships going forward but they want to do the same thing next year they want to try to meet some new people and connect with others in the church so if that's your heart you know don't feel like hey you know you have to stay with the same group because that's your group we want to give everybody the freedom to pray about these things and just be thinking about it next year when we start groups again uh, kind of what you would like to do and, and where you would like to be when we start forming our group. So enough about all of that, guys. We want to finish up our study on Hebrews. And so we're going to get to Hebrews tonight. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12 and chapter 13. And um, I'm going to kind of fly through these two chapters. For one, this is the last lesson that we have. And so I'm not going to be able to do one chapter at a time. But it really fits okay. Because chapters 12 and 13 are really the conclusion of the whole book. And what we find in chapters 12 and 13, very similar to a whole lot of the other New Testament epistles, and that is that there's a lot of theological teaching on the front, and at the end of the book, there's some just very practical stuff, like, so how does this apply, you know, at your work? How do you treat people in the world? How do you, you know... How do you treat your parents? How do you treat your elders? How do you, you know, how do you treat the government? And so um, a lot of times there's a lot of, practi uh, of theological teaching and then some real quick practical, here's how this should work itself out in day-to-day -day living. And that's kind of what Hebrews 12 and 13 are. And so tonight we're just going to look at the great conclusion of the book of Hebrews. Now I'm going to read um, verse 12 or excuse me chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 but we're going to finish there also so i want to read it and then i'm just going to kind of highlight some of the different passages in the next two chapters and we're going to finish with where we start so let's read verses 1 and 2 of hebrews chapter 12 therefore since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses 
Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So what we're told here is let us consider all these people from Hebrews 11, our forefathers of the faith, let us consider them and let's run the race. Stop thinking about giving it up no matter how hard it gets. He uses the word endurance and he says, keep your eyes on Jesus. This is the grand conclusion of the book of Hebrews is that run the race. Don't give up. Don't turn back. As we were, as we studied last week, all the people, the heroes of our faith, they were amazing, not because they kept the law, not because they were Jews. They were amazing because they were a people who walked by faith and God's calling us to do the same thing. And we are reminded that we are surrounded by these people. Uh, in other words, the idea is that, you know, we are, uh, they're watching us possibly. The idea is that we are part of this great assembly. And because we are part of this great assembly, therefore surrounded by this great assembly of great people of faith, let each of us run our individual race that God has called us to run. So I want to look at a couple of uh, passages in, in the next two chapters just to kind of highlight some very practical Christian living. So in chapter 13, in verse 1, we are told to let brotherly love continue and do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. And so we are reminded that we need to, what do we need to do? Some very practical stuff. We need to love one another. We need to let brotherly love continue. And we, we, need, to, we need to treat everybody with that same type of love and respect. And the, the Bible teaches us that it's possible that we've even entertained or come in contact with angels unaware that we were dealing with angels. And so the idea there is not only should you be good to all people and should we be good to strangers, but you never know if it's not an actual stranger and it's possibly an angel that, you know, is sent for one reason or another from God in some form of a test. And so we need to love people. We need to let brotherly love continue again, very practical. So like, so what should we do then being persecuted, being, being treated at times as the scum of the earth, uh, feeling like, you know, our lives are, could possibly be threatened if we're vocal about our faith. What should we do? Well, we should run the race. We should let brotherly love continue. We should do good to strangers. Um, also, let's look at uh, verse 14 of Hebrews 13. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. We are told here that this is not our home. We do not own or have a city here. We're seeking a city that is to come. We're reminded that our ultimate reward is in heaven and that that is where we need to have our focus. In verse 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Hey, can you see just how practical all of this is? It's very practical advice. These are, these are, it's amazing how there's so much theology and there's a lot of spiritual truth in everything that leads up to this. But this is the amazing thing about the word of God is that it ultimately leads to practical Christian living. We don't take ownership in this world. We don't have a city here. Our citizenship is in heaven. Our focus is on heaven. In the meantime, 
You want to share what you have with others. Take what you do have and use it to benefit others around you. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for their keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Did you know the Bible teaches us two things here that are important practically? Number one, that we need to um, obey. That's the word that it uses, the leadership of our true spiritual leaders. But it tells us this, not, you know, and it's not just that because they're the leaders, we have to obey them. It tells us, it says they give an account for the souls of those whom they oversee. That is a, a heavy, holy, and humbling burden for true spiritual leaders to carry, that we will give an account for the souls that we care for. We better be teaching them correctly. We better be leading them correctly. We better be providing good examples for them to follow. And so uh, really awesome, awesome truth here. Okay, so um, I want to go back to chapter 12, and we're going to close again where we started. But this time I want to get through verse 4. I think I'm going to do verse five and six as well. Okay, here we go. So therefore, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So this is the start of the big conclusion of practical living and instead of dealing with some specifics, it just says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. This is practical advice that applies to every area of the Christian life. You know, there's weights and sins, and they're both bad. Sins, I would argue, are worse in that they are what ultimately cause us to be distant from God. Uh, these are things that are clearly wrong and sinful as taught by the Bible. But just because something isn't a sin does not mean that it can't hinder you. And those things that hinder us from being all that we can be for God, what we might be able to argue, it's not necessarily a sin. The Bible doesn't say, I can't do that. Listen, if it is a hindrance that keeps you from accomplishing the race that God has for you, then you need to get that thing out of your life and run the race with all the energy that you can and all the focus that you can. Number two, in, chapter, in verse two, we we're told, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That statement has an even clearer meaning when you've been through this whole study of Hebrews and you understand that the Hebrew people were considering going back to the old Judaist way of Judaism. And why? Because it was getting too hard. It was getting too difficult to be a Christian. Here's what he says, consider Jesus, who for the joy that was before him endured the shame and was despised and ultimately went through the cross. Why? Because of the joy set before him. See how the application is to the believers, you and I. We, we, we've got to do the same thing. Consider Jesus, the, the author and founder and perfecter of our faith. He endured hard times, much harder than you and I endure. He was despised, but he took it all on consciously, knowing what he would have to endure. He took it all on because of the joy set before him. He knew what would eventually come as he stayed faithful to the will of God. And that is what we're being reminded, like we should follow Jesus in that example when we endure hardship, we should focus on the joy that is before us. The author takes it even further. Verse 3, Consider him 
who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted in your struggle against sin. You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood. So here we see that the struggle isn't just against people. No, it's against sin. The struggle isn't just against those that want to persecute us. I mean, quite frankly, the major, most pressing, and relentless struggle for the Christian is the struggle against sin, to stay holy, righteous, to follow the will of God, not to quench the Holy Spirit. We see here that this is a great part of our struggle. Now listen to what it says. It says that we have not struggled to the point of shedding blood, struggled against sin to the point of shedding blood. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points like we were. We studied this in Hebrews, yet without sin. So he was tempted to sin, but never did. And he resisted that temptation to the point of bloodshed. Now, here's where that happened. That happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. When you study Luke's gospel, he tells us that when Jesus was there and he cried out, God, if there's any other way, Father, if there's any other way to let this cup pass, let it pass from me. The Bible tells us that his sweat became as great drops of blood. He resisted sin even to the point that he sweated blood. You and I have never done that. That's what the author's saying. And here's the, the uh, insinuation. I'm just going to tell you the way old Joplin Emerson sees it. Here, here's the insinuation. Stop being babies. Stop acting like it's so hard to be a Christian. And look at your Savior. You have never suffered like he suffered. You have never been persecuted like he was persecuted. And you have never resisted sin like he resisted sin to the point of bloodshed. So, stop being babies. Stop whining. Stop wanting to roll over and give up. Get some guts about you. Get some courage about you. Get some strength about you. Be like Jesus and set your face like a flint that you're going to do the word of God and you're going to live the will of God. And you quit thinking about going back and grow up a little bit, mature up a little bit, man up a little bit, strengthen up a little bit, and be focused on the joy that is ahead of us. That's hard, a little bit, but notice the words that follow, immediately follow, and we're going to close here. Verse 5, and have you forgotten the exaltation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one whom he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Now, the important piece here is not necessarily the chastising. What the point the author is making is something that never would have been considered in the Judaism way they were thinking about going back to. And that point is this. Do not forget, you are sons and daughters of God now. You have been born again, adopted into the family of God God sees you as sons and daughters. Have you forgotten that? Remember that scripture that talks about how the father chastises a son whom he loves? <laughs> it's a reference to you and I. We have become the sons and daughters of God. Why would we ever want to give that up? Why would we ever want to go back to something lesser? And so... This, really, this right here, these final verses, in, in, or these opening verses in Hebrews 12 are the big conclusion, 
And then everything that follows through the end of chapter 13 are like some of the ways that practically works it out in our lives. And I just want to leave us tonight with the big conclusion of the book of Hebrews. And that is that we all have a race to run. And when it starts to get hard, consider Jesus and all that he went through. When you find yourself struggling with sin and think it's just impossible to say no, consider Jesus who resisted sin to the point of bloodshed. And when you start thinking that this is hard, you have got to remember that Jesus did it all for the joy that was set before him. And so there's two things we want to think about. We want to think about the joy that is before us, what is coming for God's people. And then currently, right now, we want to remind ourselves that even in all of this world that we live in and the suffering and sometimes persecution that we endure and the hardness that we deal with of fighting the old flesh nature and fighting off sin, we want to remember this. We are the sons and daughters of God. What an incredible truth. And consequently, there is a way we ought to live. And there is no better life. There is no better way than that of the sons and daughters of God. This, brothers and sisters, is the grand conclusion of the book of Hebrews. I hope that you've enjoyed the study. I've certainly enjoyed studying it myself and having the opportunity to teach it. Hope you all have a great discussion. Again, thank you for being part of our life groups this year and look forward to starting back up again uh, when we start the school year here in the fall. God bless you all and have a good night.